Following video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. <laughs>
and we would make it what's called a live surface, which allows us then to draw um, kind of what you're saying with like expanding rectangles and like carving out like floor plans. We would take uh, the quad draw tool and snap vertices and quads to the surface of these spheres. So we're pretty much drawing floor plans on spheres of different sizes. And then we would extrude those floor plans into things like simple cave networks. The fact that like a lot of these programs uh, work in Cartesian coordinates instead of like a polar coordinate system was also kind of a pain in the ass. Building a space exploration game out of spheres that uses Kepler's laws of planetary motion for calculating gravitational pull between them, that doesn't just stress the hell out of Unity and Phys X, but also the real-life scale of these phenomena they're trying to depict. We, we call it a miniature solar system. If you took the real solar system and you scaled it down to the size of Outer Wilds, all of the planets would be like the size of a marble, because the relative distances between them is huge. Um, and so in most cases, with the gravity for the planets, it actually falls off linearly in Outer Wilds, um, whereas it should actually fall off due to the inverse square law. But what, the, what, what that means, basically, is that the gravitational pulls around planets are far stronger in Outer Wilds than they'd be in real life. But the effect fades away faster at distances, so they don't attract each other too much. Objects of this mass, this close to one another, would totally collide in real life. Because all the planets are actually physically moving around the sun, uh, and they're all moving at different speeds, there's really no such thing as a zero velocity. Um, yeah. All of the calculations for everything in the game had to be done uh, relative to some other moving object. To compare the scale of gravity's force, as seen in Outer Wilds with a more realistic visualization like Space Engine, is to compare a mosquito's world to that of an entire mountain. If you zoom out far enough to see the full orbital paths of our own solar system, then the planets have become so small they might as well be invisible. So the gravitational pulls of these toy box sized planets on your toy box sized spaceship rapidly fades from under exaggeration to over exaggeration depending on your distance. But the team didn't use those same rules for the sun in the middle of the system, whose gravitational pull is more realistic with a much larger range, serving as an ever-present reminder, no matter where you are, of whose system you're still inside of. You're always drifting towards the sun to some little bit, so you're also always overcompensating a bit to steer away from it. If you park your ship at the very, very edge of the solar system and then let go of the controls and wait, this is what happens. So if you point your ship at your destination and try to fly in a straight line, like, like usually in a video game, that's not going to work here. You have to tickle the controller left, right, up or down, accelerate or decelerate as you pass through the invisible gravity poles of planets and stars along the way. As I climbed the learning curve of learning how to fly under the influence of different gravities and how to quickly crunch relative numbers between moving objects, a very different kind of muscle memory developed. Thanks to the magic of game feel, I now feel like I have a better grasp on some of the most outrageous concepts in science that most of us are never going to have to tackle in our day-to-day -day life. Like how all that space out there, all that empty blackness of the pure vacuum, is supposed to have a kind of texture to it. A texture woven into all that empty space by time. In order to cook a bowl of noodles from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Our most ancient methods of observing the universe were the same as our methods for measuring time. To record the position of the sun, moon, or stars, or how long it takes for matter to fall through an hourglass or a water clock, is to record evidence of gravity. You cannot have time without gravity. Gravity pulls matter through the medium of time into increasingly massive whirlpools of increasingly stronger gravity. Under the heavier gravity of gas giants, stars, and black holes, everything nearby becomes heavier, down to the atomic level. 
Under such weight grinding the matter down, clocks would tick slower, fluids would circulate slower, and human beings, if they could survive the crushing pressures, would age, think, and live slower. But with your senses and your mind all ticking at a slower rate, you would not really be able to notice that. So time, gravity, and space all have a directly connected relationship. Gravity pulls all matter and space towards a nearby spot where it will age slightly slower than in its previous spot. Since atoms decay faster under low gravity and slower under high gravity, this dilation in the flow of time has been repeatedly confirmed by atomic clocks aboard the International Space Station. GPS satellites must account for it when giving you your directions. This is even happening as you change elevation on the surface of Earth. As you move closer or further away from the planet's core, time will change by an imperceptibly negligible difference of fractions of nanoseconds. This interaction between space and time is usually visualized on a grid that compresses its grid lines around the centers of gravity. But this is a two-dimensional grid, and we are not in a two-dimensional universe. Gravity would not cause objects to roll underneath planets, as seen here. As we have all experienced, it causes things to fall into planets instead, towards the planet's core. For a more effective metaphor, we need another dimension. Let's pretend that this bowl of water is the universe. Now, if I stir this water and poke and prod at it in semi-random directions, I can feel with my fingers how not every spot inside the water bowl feels the same as every other spot. For a snapshot of a few seconds before it all settles down, there is a diversity of invisible sensations in there, as the water folds and distorts to account for the forces acting upon it. Now. Let's add some solid matter, say a pinch of breadcrumbs, and stir. And we have a metaphor for how space and time distort around celestial objects that drift through the ever-changing currents of gravity. There are no tiny motors, no independent power source helping these grains move through the water. The water is what's pushing them and moving around them, eventually leading them to the bottom of the bowl, a spot in the universe ever so slightly closer to the Earth's core, where the atoms in these breadcrumbs will age ever so slightly slower than at their previous spot in the universe. For our metaphor, the crumbs can be planets, stars, or entire galaxies. The water is space, the currents keeping our objects afloat, are gravitational forces which originate with my fingers creating dramatically violent big bangs and supernovas whose energy explodes, dissipates, and eventually expires. Imagine what all this would look like from a perspective inside the bowl, from a microscopic organism living on top of a breadcrumb. Watching all this happen at a trillionth of the speed I can observe it with, from a perspective a trillion times smaller than mine. Those of us who will never experience space travel for ourselves no longer have to imagine many of its distant, alien, and invisible forces thanks to the effectiveness of this simulation. However, an effective simulation of time dilation is still beyond the reach of this consumer-level video game. They were curious if there was time dilation made a trail. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, there's no time dilation. Oh yeah, no, that would be crazy. Uh, although it was, there was time dilation in the Alpha. We, we did, we, yeah, sort of. There was, there was an island in Giant's Deep um, that... There's, there's no situation in the game where time local from your perspective moves at a different rate than like the rest of the game. Because yeah. that would be a ton of work, um, but it'd be really cool. Despite the space age setting, the game's physics engine is really calculating 500 year old formulas deduced by Newton and Kepler. But the game's puzzle design involves a much more radically rescaled and significantly less simulated version of a much newer field of science, brought to us in the 20th century by Einstein and Bohr. In only very specific situations, with admittedly fantastical rules whose mention would spoil the puzzle solutions themselves, the game explores the conundrums of quantum physics. But I must stop myself there. The game's physics engine is admittedly less interesting in modeling the movements of quanta than it is simulating the exchange of gravity between planets and their stars. Atoms are observable and understood. Their movement, mass, and behaviors can all be precisely predicted. But the things atoms are made out of cannot be. 
photons and electrons change their behavior depending on whether or not they're being observed. If you split up or separate those particles into two, they can wirelessly connect to one another across large distances, and we don't currently know why. Protons have the ghastly ability to pass through solid matter, and the formulas that quantum physicists have developed to try and predict these strange behaviors are more about calculating probabilities and chances rather than final answers. But the fact that these probabilities can be reliably calculated has been used to make an entire century's worth of reliable new technology. The semiconductors, microprocessors, the cathode ray tubes, liquid crystal displays, and fiber optic cables, these fundamental technologies for our age of high-tech electronics were the fruit of exploring a bizarre, alien world smaller than the atom. But at the heart of this discomfort and debate is an argument just as philosophical as it is scientific, and that is the question of whether or not randomness, probability, and luck can actually exist in a universe governed by precise mathematics. Because reality as we know it, all of these natural results like the random noisy pattern of a spill, the chaos of a spiraling storm, even the settling of dust, all follow the same physical rules that govern all matter in the entire universe made out of atoms. The same formulas, the same precise math, determines the outcome of every single thing that moves through space, time, and the universe. But, once you start observing things smaller than the atom, the mathematics, the classical physics, and some supposed divine predictability to the universe, all start to come into question. But we have been there before, lighting up the dark corners of the universe through the slow, steady march of scientific progress. Be curious is really the most important thing that I think we want players to take away from this. Just seeking answers, seeking truth, and being fundamentally curious is incredibly important to being human bringing our, ourselves individually and as a collective species forward. Though he helped start the new study of physics, Einstein was not a fan of the conclusions that quantum physics was drawing. Einstein believed that it gave a limit to human knowledge, which he did not think was finite. That there was more work to be done, that there would eventually be a better underlying unifying theory somewhere, somewhere out there. I didn't come up with that last line. That's from a Curiosity Stream documentary called The Secrets of Quantum Physics, which you are going to want to watch after playing this game. Professor Jim Al Khalili demonstrates some of the hardest to imagine experiments with visual models that are tactile and effective, with an energy that conveys why the creepiest limits of science are so exciting for people like him to be exploring. Now, hell, given the subject matter, you're probably going to want to watch his other BBC documentaries on there too. Curiosity Stream is a documentary streaming service featuring thousands of educational titles from educational media institutions, covering history, society, quantum physics, and regular physics. It's just $2.99 a month, but you can sign up for a free month at curiositystream.com slash superbunnyhop. Curiosity Stream is also partnering with Nebula, a platform for educational content creators looking to build a more sustainable platform than YouTube, a place to put experimental and special content, which, uh, in practice, unfortunately, now means stuff like World War II history. So hey, if you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you're helping out an entire community of educational YouTubers too, and you'll get a code for both. Thanks for watching, thanks for supporting, and have a wonderful day. I'm teaching your son about the universe.